This lesson is about limits, and we'll learn how to evaluate limits graphically and numerically. First, let's talk about what is meant by the concept of a limit. A mathematical limit is a tool that enables us to broaden our ability to evaluate functions. Occasionally, when working with functions, we run into undefined values. These happen with division by zero, even roots of negatives, these sorts of things. What do we do in those cases? How do we continue to work with them? Well, a limit helps us do that. However, a limit does not tell us what the value of the function is, because generally it's undefined, but rather what it should be in order to produce a continuous curve. Um, and I'll explain that through some examples, and hopefully that will make sense to you in just a few minutes. When we are speaking of continuity, we'll dive into the details of continuity in a later section, but just for now, think of continuity as the ability to draw the graph of a curve without having to lift your pencil. And know that all of our elementary functions, and the elementary functions are things like polynomials, uh, exponentials, logarithms, sine, cosine, those sorts of things know that they are all continuous on their domains. So the only places where we really have to worry about discontinuities at this level are places where division by zero can occur, that's a big one, and places where piecewise defined functions are joined together. And in order to work with limits and fully understand their uh, concept, we do have to dive into some piecewise defined functions. If you're unfamiliar with piecewise defined functions or hesitant to work with them, you probably need to go ahead and review those at this point so that you can fully understand what we're dealing with when it comes to limits. We're also unable to take even roots or square roots of negative values, logarithms of negative values or zero, but these are places where the functions are not defined over a range of values, rather than at a single point. So limits really help us at single values. So kind of keep that in mind as we go through these different examples. So to help you understand what's meant by a limit, let's begin looking at a limit that happens to exist. So consider the function f of x equals x squared minus 4 divided by x minus 2. Now in class, I generally will ask students, what do you think the graph of this function looks like? And I'll get a lot of very good answers. Uh, often I'll get the answer that the graph of this must be somewhat parabolic, because there's a squared term in it, and we know that all squared uh, polynomials have the graph of a parabola. Okay, that's a great guess. Uh, I get guesses of things like there's a asymptote in this graph because there's division by zero. That's also a great observation, a great guess, and I applaud that. However, generally, students never guess that the graph of this is a line because when they think of the equation of a line, they think of the equation of a line being y equals mx plus b. And y equals mx plus b, that doesn't look anything like what we have here. However, if I work with this uh, a little bit, manipulate it algebraically, I could uh, factor the numerator into the difference of squares, so x plus 2 times the quantity x minus 2, and then I have the quantity x minus 2 in the denominator, which matches one of the factors in the numerator, so that can cancel out. So I can cancel out this term right here, which leaves me sort of x plus 2. Now, that looks a lot more like a line, so it's a bit more understandable as to why this 
graph is a line at this point. So let me show you the graph. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it on the calculator. Because I, I'm going to do as much on the calculator as I can because I want to train you on how to use the calculator properly. Because a lot of students are rely on the calculator a lot more than I think they should and have weaker skills with the calculator than I think you need to. So um, in order to get this graph, of course we go under y equals, we enter the function. The one thing that you need to understand when you have division, you have to put in parentheses that, don't ex that you don't see initially. So you're taking the entire numerator divided by the entire denominator. In order to make that happen correctly, you have to put the numerator and denominator in parentheses. So I'll do that. x caret and then 2 makes an x squared. Then minus 4, close parentheses, divided by the factor x minus 2. If I didn't do the parentheses, it would be x squared minus 4 divided by x minus 2, which would be a completely different function graph. So I just hit graph, I'm in the standard viewing window, negative 10, positive 10, and so forth. Okay, here's the line. This is almost our graph. There's one additional feature that's missing in the calculator, and that's actually the reason I drew this in the calculator, because I want you to understand the limitations of your calculator. Here's the actual graph of this function. It is that line that you're seeing on the calculator screen. However, there's a hole in the graph. But here's how your calculator works. When it comes to graphing, it only knows a couple of different things. It knows how to take values of x, plug them into a function, figure out values of y. So if it took negative 1 and plugged it into a function, it would find that value. If it put 0 in, it would get this. 1 in, it would get this. 2 in, oh, well, it would get undefined, so it would move on. 3 in, it would get this. 4 in, and so forth. And then, you know, it, it's actually going to do more points than this, so let, let's put in some additional points in between. So it does a whole bunch of points, and the more points it does, the better looking graph it gets. So it does a whole bunch of points. The other thing that it does is plays connect the dots. So um, it gets this point way over here on the sideline, and then it finds this next point, and it connects those two. Then it finds the next point, and connects. Next point, connects, and so forth. And it just keeps doing this until it gets to the other side of the graph. Now, when it approaches 2, it finds that there's an undefined value. So it skips 2 and it moves on to the next point. So this point over here, it finds, and then it draws a line right over where that open circle should have been. So it technically found the open circle, but it just sort of ignored it. Now, some of the calculators are actually getting a bit more uh, precise, and they are skipping those points altogether. And that's great. You may have one that does that. but in general, the calculators don't do that. So you need to understand that limitation of your calculator. OK, so let's uh, erase this. And let's talk about this hole in the graph anyway. So the reason that there's a hole in this graph is because when you say two things are equal in mathematics, you are saying on an infinite scale, from negative infinity all the way to positive infinity, that these two functions agree with one another at every single point. If there is one single point where they disagree, they're not equal. That's just simply how mathematics works. They either agree everywhere, or we just say they don't. However, if it is a finite number of points where they disagree, especially if it's just one, then we can kind of get around with a domain restriction. So for instance, I could say instead of that f of x is equal to x plus 2, which is not true, 
because the original function you get division by 0 at 2 the new function you get 4 when you plug in so they disagree at that single point but if I say that this is equal to x plus 2 at every point so where x does not equal 2 then I'm saying they agree at every single point except for 2. That's what makes the hole in the graph. So we're undefining this one value in the line x plus 2. That's why we have graph of the line x plus 2 with a hole in it. So this is what the graph should look like. Now, when it comes to a limit, so in order to uh, define a limit, remember what we said, it is a value that the function should be in order to produce a continuous curve. So this line is continuous at every single point except for the hole. That's the only place where there's a discontinuity. So you'd have to stop drawing the line and then draw the other part of the line in order so you can't draw it in one swoop. And it doesn't count to make the little circle in one swoop and then move on. No cheating here. So let me pull this example up in a more interactive display and hopefully I can help you fully understand what's meant by a limit here with this example and the next. So here we are back to our uh, line with the hole in it. And what I would like to do is take a look at what happens to values of y as we allow x to approach this point where there's a discontinuity. So we're allowing x to get closer and closer to 2 and we're trying to see what's happening with the y values. So let me, uh, let me turn on some the limits here and zoom in. Okay, that looks good. Now, uh, right now, x is equal to 1, and when x is equal to 1, y is equal to 3. So if I put 1 into my function, I get 3 right back out. If I let x get closer and closer to 2, so the values are increasing from 1 up to 2 on the x-axis, notice what's happening to the y values. They're also, they are also increasing, but they are increasing up to, looks like it's going to get close to 4. And if I allow this to equal 2, which with the scale I can't quite get it exactly at 2, so let me just set it to 2, it disappears. Well, the reason why it disappears when x is equal to 2 is because it, the function is undefined there. So I can't just plug in 2 to see what the value of the function is. It's undefined. But I can look at values that are approaching 2. So if I want this to be a continuous line, it needs to be approaching this value right here, which looks like is going to be about 4. And same thing from the right. If I approach from values that are larger than 2 but getting closer and closer to 2, then I'm getting values along the y which are getting, again, closer and closer to 4. But if I bring that value all the way to 2, the same thing happens. It's undefined right at 2. So if I zoom in a little bit more, it, it undefined there, so I can't evaluate it right at 2, but I can get really close to 2. In fact, I can get infinitely close to 2. I just can't equal 2. That's the problem. But on both sides, that limit is getting... these values are limiting to the number 4. So on the left-hand side of 2 and the right-hand side of 2, they're limiting to the value 4 that's the value of our limit. So 
what we can say is that the limit as x approaches 4 of this particular function, and this is the notation that we use when we're working with limits, so that limit is equal to 4. So it's the y value that the function needs to be in order to create a continuous curve. So if at, whoops, x approaches 2. I apologize for that. So the limit as x approaches 2, so when we get x close to 2, if this particular y value was 4, then we would have a continuous curve. So there is one number that we can put in which would produce a continuous curve. So the limit doesn't really care what the value of the function is. It only cares what it should be in order to get that continuity. And in order to get continuity, you have to have the left-hand side and the right-hand side agreeing with one another in order to be continuous. Now let's look at a limit that does not exist. So this time consider the function f of x equals x plus 1 when x is less than or equal to 2 and 1 when x is greater than 2. Now this is a piecewise defined function. And piecewise defined functions are generally made up of elementary functions that are continuous on their domains. So the only thing that really matters is or the only place where discontinuity could occur is generally at the point where they're fused together. So here's the graph of this, this function. So here's where x is 2. Okay, so notice the boundary point here is 2. And for values that are less than 2, we have the line x plus 1. So notice the y-intercept of 1 and the slope of 1. And for values greater than 2, we have the constant positive 1. So that's where we get this graph. Now let's examine uh, interactively what happens with the limit of this function. OK, so I have the graph. It's scaled a little bit differently than what had uh, been on the previous screen, but it's the same graph. So we're going to look at the limit from the left-hand side and the right-hand side and see if they agree with one another um, at this point of discontinuity so that we can see if the limit exists. So let's examine, examine the limit from the left. So for values that are less than 2, but approaching 2 on the x-axis, the y values are increasing, and we want to increase 2. So as I get closer and closer to 2, those y values are getting closer and closer to the value 3. So the limit from the left is 3. Okay. Now, the limit from the right, let's take a look at that. Since this graph is a constant graph, no matter what I put in for x, the output value is always 1 since it's a constant. So as I approach positive 2 from the right-hand side, I'm always going to get 1 back out. So the limit from the right is 1. The limit from the left is 3. The problem there is there's no single value that I can put in here that would make this a continuous curve. I have to have one point a limit only allows me one point to put in to make a continuous curve. So what happens here is there's no single point I could put in to make this continuous. So what we say is that the limit does not exist. And generally, DNE is how we uh, state that. So going back to our notebook, what we say is the limit as x approaches 2 for our function does not exist. So there's no single value I can put in that would give me a continuous curve. 
So at this point, I think it would be a good opportunity to really define what's meant by a limit of a function at a single point. So for the limit of a function, what we have to have occurring is in order to have continuity, we have to have the limit from the left and the limit from the right agreeing with one another. And it doesn't matter if that point is missing or if it exists, we're not concerned with continuity actually existing right now. We're just concerned that the possibility would be there. So let L be a real number. And if the limit as x approaches a from the left-hand side of a function is equal to L, that little negative, uh, which looks like an exponent on the a, that's the notation for a left-handed limit. A positive on the a means it's a right-handed limit. So this is just saying the limit from the left and the limit from the right. So if both of those limits exist and are equal to one another, then we can say that the limit as x approaches a is equal to L. So we say that exists and is equal to L. Otherwise, we say that this limit does not exist. So either those two, the left-handed and the right-handed limit, agree with one another, and therefore you have a single point that you could put in to make a continuous function, or the limit does not exist. There's no one point you could put in. So every time we have to evaluate a limit, generally, graphically, or numerically at least, the definition tells us that we need to do three things. Find the limit from the left, find the limit from the right, compare those two values, then if they're equal, that's the value of the limit, and if they're not equal, the limit does not exist. Let's take a look at a fairly classic example with graphical limits. So there's no function provided here. It's just a graph, and we are asked to evaluate limits on this graph at different points. So for instance, the first one that we're asked to do is the limit as x approaches negative 5 of this particular function. So what we would need to start off doing is finding the limit as x approaches negative 5 from the left, and then the limit as x approaches negative 5 from the right. And finding those, we just use the graph itself. So here's negative 5. So what I want to do is see what's happening to the graph as we approach this x value. So from the left-hand side, observing the y values, they are increasing up to this particular point. Now that particular point, it looks to me like it's at positive 4. So I think that's a safe assumption that the limit from the left here is positive 4. And then if we observe the values coming from the right-hand side, on the y values, these are approaching this point, which appears to be at positive 2. So what happens is the limit from the left and the limit from the right are different values. Therefore, the limit at negative 5 does not exist. So there's a jump in the graph. And if there's a jump in the graph, the limit does not exist. All right, next up, let's take a look at the next one that they want us to do, which is the limit as x approaches negative 2. So for negative 2, what's happening here is we have an asymptote. So this graph is going off to positive and negative infinity. And on the left-hand side, we have this graph going down to negative infinity. On the right-hand side, this graph is going up to positive infinity. Well, those don't agree with one another. So we have the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left. That was negative infinity. 
the limit as x approaches 2 from the right was positive infinity. So they don't agree, which means the limit does not exist. And in fact, if a limit goes to infinity, even if it's positive infinity on both sides, it still does not exist. Although if it's positive infinity on both sides, we can get a little bit more information by saying positive infinity, but we still understand that it does not exist. All right, then next up is the limit as x approaches 1. So let's see what happens when we let x approach 1. So coming from the left-hand side, so we're letting x go to 1, so the y values here are also going to 1. The x values go to 1 on the x-axis, which means the y values are also going to 1. So these things agree. So since they agree, the limit as x approaches 1 is 1. And lastly, the limit as x approaches 3. So here's 3. Let me get rid of some of these marks. So there's 3. What we want to do is see what happens on the left-hand side of 3 and then the right-hand side of 3 in the y values. So on the left-hand side, these y values are going up to this particular point, which is at 4. So the limit from the left is 4. On the right-hand side, these values are approaching this same point. So the limit from the right is also equal to 4. Since the limit from the left and the limit from the right agree with one another, we say that this limit exists and is equal to 4. In this next example, we're going to look at how we can do a limit numerically without the use of the graph. However, I'll use the graph just so I can show you exactly what's happening based off our understanding of graphical limits. Here's our function. Uh, we want to evaluate the limit as x approaches 3 of x minus 3 divided by the quantity x squared minus 2x minus 3. Okay, so what we would need to do then is evaluate the limit from the left of 3, evaluate the limit from the right of 3, and then compare those two numbers. So in order to do that, let's take a look at an interactive version of this. Right, here's our graph. So it turns out there's a hole in the graph and there is an asymptote. So there's two points of discontinuity here. But the only point that we're interested in is the point of discontinuity where uh, x is 3 because that's our limit value. Now, we can, in fact, look at the graph. And if I look at the graph, then what I would observe here is as x approaches 3 on the graph, so as we go to 3, these values are getting closer and closer to this point. But if you'll notice, this point is somewhere between 0 and 1. So it's not entirely clear as to exactly where that's approaching. If it were an integer value, it might be a bit easier. But here it's not completely clear. What is nice is that the limit from the left and the limit from the right are agreeing with one another, so it's going to be the same on both sides. But what exactly is that value? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to use a table of values instead and observe what's happening right around 3. So when I show you these uh, left-handed limits and right-handed limits, that's effectively what's happening here. So the limit from the left I allow values to get closer and closer to 3. And as they get closer and closer to 3, I can observe what's happening with the y values. Same thing with the limit from the right. I can observe values that are getting closer and closer to 3 from the right-hand side and see what's happening with those y values. Essentially, what I'm doing is setting up a table of values and just observing what they're approaching. Uh, if I zoom in, I have to be careful how I zoom because I'll lose my labels. 
If I really zoom in on that point, I can get closer and closer to the y values. So as I let it get closer to 3, if you'll notice, I'm really getting close to 3 on both sides. It looks like it's getting closer and closer to 0.25. But how do, we, how do you do that outside of this program? If you just have a calculator, how are you going to do that? Well, the standard way is something similar to what you see over here on the right-hand side. So on the right-hand side, we have a table representing the limit from the left and a table representing the limit from the right. So if you'll notice what I've done, the limit from the left, I've looked at values that were less than 3, but getting increasingly closer to 3. So 2.9 is pretty close to 3, but 2.99 is even closer. And then I evaluate the function at that point, and I observe what's happening. So at 2.9, the value is 0.2564. At 2.99, it's 0.2506. If I get even closer, and these are actually getting exponentially closer, I eventually settle on getting pretty much right on that value. So when x is 2.9999, I get a right about 2.25. So I think my initial guess was correct here. And then the limit from the right, what I'm doing is I'm letting x be values that are slightly larger than 3, but getting closer and closer, and then observing the y values by plugging into the function. So if I plug 3.1 into the function, this is what I get. If I put 3.0 in, this is what I get, and so forth. So eventually I get down to 3.0001, which gives me something extremely close to 0.25. But again, this is all set up automatically for you on this program. How do we do this in the calculator? So let's bring up the calculator and learn how that's done. So in order to do this in the calculator, what we have to do is basically set up our own table. So a limit from the left for our own table. We want to take values of x that are less than 3, so as we did in the program, 2.9, 2.99. We just want to let these continually increase up to 3, but we don't want to exceed 3. So we're just getting values that are getting closer and closer to 3, but not exceeding 3. And we just need to plug these in our calculator in order to get what the values are approaching. So here's a couple of ways we could do that clear out of this. All right, so 2.9. I could take 2.9 minus 3, that would be the my numerator, and then divide that by 2.9 squared minus 2 times 2.9 and minus 3, and I get 0.2564, which if you'll recall from that program, that's exactly what we had. And you can go about it that way. That's not too bad. It saves you a lot of effort with working from uh, decimal values, but it's still a bit inconvenient because we have a lot of numbers to plug in. So here's a better way. We'll go under y equals, and we will put our function in. Now remember, um, because there is a division bar, I need to put parentheses around the numerator and denominator uh, in order to make sure this works properly, so the order of operations work properly. So x minus 3 over x squared minus 2x minus 3. Now, instead of graphing it, I'm going to use what's called a table within the calculator. And so in order to use a table, I hit second and window, which are table settings. And as long as you don't turn your calculator or take your batteries out, reset it or anything like that, you won't need to make this change anymore. But your table, what you want to do is set it up to where it will ask you for your independent variable, which is your x variable. And then it will automatically calculate your dependent variable, which is the y 
which is based off of the function that you gave. Okay, you don't have to worry about table start, delta table, anything like that. Just hit second and graph, which takes you into the table feature now. And you can just type in numbers into the X, and it will automatically determine what Y is. So as long as you have your, your function typed in properly, order of operations working, this is a whole lot easier. And you can go all the way up to as much accuracy as you need in order to make sure you get the value of your limit. So 0.2506 for the next value, 0.2501 for the value after that, and it looks like 0 0.2500. So as our values approach 3 from the left-hand side on the x, the values here are approaching 1 quarter, which is 0 0.25 uh, on the y-axis. So that's the limit from the left. The limit from the right, then, what we would have to do is start with values that are slightly larger than 3, but getting closer and closer closer to 3. The nice thing is, if you already have your function in your calculator, then all you have to do is just put in new values. So I would just type over the ones you have in there. And as you can see, so point uh, 0.2439 then 0 0.2494, 0 0.2494 again. Oh, because I didn't do, <laughs> oops. Sometimes if I type too quickly, it doesn't catch both input values. All right, so 0.2499, and then the last one is 0.2499 again, which x values from the right are approaching 3, the y values from the right are also approaching 0.25, which is 1 quarter. So the limit from the left and the limit from the right agree with one another, and therefore the limit is 1 fourth. So that's how you can do this numerically, and we really wouldn't need the graph in order to do this. We could just have done this from the function. I simply showed you the graph because I want you to understand where everything, how it all fits together. Now, the next thing that I want you to understand is that if you have a limit point that already exists on a graph, so if you already have continuity, then that limit's just going to agree with whatever the function's value is. So, for example, let's look at this function the limit as x approaches 1 of 4 minus x squared. Here's our function graphed so that we can interact with it. I've even included the point 1, 3, which is the point on the graph where x is equal to 1. Now, by having a graph, it, it sort of implied that that is a closed circle, but I've just highlighted the point with the closed circle. But the thing is, you don't need a point there to do a limit. Like You can have any point on the graph as long as it's part of the continuous curve. Now, if you look at the limit from the left and the limit from the right in these values over here. So I have values that are slightly less than uh, 1, but then approaching 1. And if you'll notice, the values numerically are getting closer and closer to 3. And then I have values starting from the right, which are greater than 1, but getting closer and closer to 1 itself. And those numbers are approaching 3 as well. So if this point didn't exist, if it happened to be an open circle, for instance, then what we would determine is the limit as we approach 1 is getting closer and closer to Three, so that's the limit value. If we let values approach from the right, 
the same thing would happen if even if that was a open circle these values would approach that point and end up giving us values that are closer and closer to 3. So the limit here is 3. But also, the thing is, we can actually get all the way over to 3. So if I set my left-hand limit, for instance, to 3, whoops, <laughs> to 3, set it to 1 on the x so that the y value is 3, it's not undefined. It is defined there. So what happens is the function is defined, it's continuous, so the, that sort of implies that the limit exists. So if you have continuity, that implies that the limit exists because you know that the limit from the left and the limit from the right would have had to have agreed with one another in order to get continuity. So anytime you try to evaluate a limit at a point that exists, it's just like evaluating the function itself. So if you want to evaluate the limit from the left doing the same thing, then of course you can, just as we did. You would plug these values into your calculator. And you don't have to always go out to four values of accuracy here. If you know what the limit's approaching at three or even at two, that's fine. But then you would use your calculator to determine what that would approach. So you would put in for y the function 4 minus x squared. Go to your table and then just start putting in these values. So 0.9 oh, uh, there we go 0.99 0.999 and 9999. So these values are approaching 3. Alright, so the limit from the left is 3, and then the limit from the right, if we work that through, we would start with values slightly larger than 1, so that would be 1.1, 1 .1, 1 .01, 1 1.01, 0 .001, 0 .001, 0 0.001, and those values uh, you can get straight from the calculator as well. and note that those are approaching 3. So 2.79, 2.97, I guess technically 9.8, but that's OK. 2.998, and then 2.9998. Oh, there, 2.98. All right, so anyway, these are also approaching 3. So the limit from the left and the limit from the right agree with one another. So that limit is 3. If you'll notice, if you just plugged in, so your function is 4 minus x squared, if you just plugged in 1 because it exists, you also get 3. So if the, if the limit value exists, you're basically done. Just find out what that value is, and that's it. Next up, here's a uh, trig function. So the limit sine x divided by x. So the limit sine x divided by x. First thing that I want to point out to you is when you are working in calculus, every time you are working with your trig functions, you are working in radians. And you need to understand that because your calculator has two different modes, degree mode and radian mode or technically it has radians and then it has some additional feature that it can kind of interpret the input value as degrees and do a conversion for you. In the end, radians are king, okay? So they're the ones that the calculator uses and y it just kind of interprets degrees for you. So in your calculator, your mode settings, make sure you're always in radian mode. 
So that way you're doing the calculus properly because if you're in degree mode, you'll get probably wrong answers just depending on at what point you're working with, but most likely wrong answers. All right, so make sure that's the case. Then what we do in order to get the limit as x approaches 0 is pretty much the same. We look at values around 0 and then try to interpret what the value of the limit is. So let's try this. So something that is larger than 0 but getting close to 0. We could have 0 0.1 or, I'm sorry, we're doing the limit from the left, so we want to get values that are less than 0 and approaching 0. So negative 0.1 is smaller than 0, but getting closer. Negative 0 0.01, negative 0 0.001, and lastly, negative 0 0.0001. So these are, in fact, getting closer to 0. So what is the y values approaching? Well, let's pull up our calculator, go under y equals, and enter this function. Now, technically speaking, there is only one term in the numerator and denominator. And by terms, I'm talking about pieces that are added or subtracted. So in the numerator, being only one term, you don't really have to put parentheses around it. But if you want to be safe, go ahead. It's not going to hurt anything. So. Uh, I'm not going to put extra parentheses around it. Sine x divided by x. Uh, order of operations will do that properly. Go into the table feature and start putting in values that we're looking at. So negative 0.1, negative 0 0.01, negative 0 0.001, negative 0 0.0001. So we have 0 0.998.9999, and then basically 1, and basically 1 again. If you'll notice that negative 1, e minus 4, sometimes if, you're, there's, if you have a bunch of leading zeros or trailing zeros, the calculator will switch to scientific notation. So that e minus 4 is just how we look at times 10 to the negative fourth power. So that's just the way the scientific notation is done on the calculator. What we can observe here, limit from the left is in fact approaching 1, so that's great. If we look at the limit from the right, then we want values that are larger than 0, but getting closer and closer to 0. These are approaching 0. Now if I put in those numbers, so 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, and then that. We're getting the same results. And that's OK. It's just a symmetric graph. Um, that's the only reason why these agree with one another the way they do. So that limit from the right-hand side is also 1, so that tells me that the limit overall is 1. And if you look at the graph of this, that makes sense, because here's what that looks like. We are approaching 0, and as we approach 0 from the left-hand side, the y values are approaching 1, and as we approach 0 from the right-hand side, those y values are approaching 1. So the limit exists. Here's another classic example here. So the limit as x approaches 2, the absolute value of x minus 2 over x minus 2. In order to, to do this in the calculator, what we would need to do first is decide on values that are smaller than 2 but approaching. So 1.9 is smaller than 2. 1.99 is getting closer, and so forth. Now, in your calculator, you can look around at the buttons, but you're not going to find any kind of absolute value bars. 
in order to do absolute value on the calculator, there's a function that's built in which will do that for you. So you have to hit the math key, go over to the num sub member, sub, <laughs> sub menu, try that again, and the first item appears as ABS. So that stands for absolute value. So these work just like those vertical bars. Whatever you put inside the parentheses of this function, you take the absolute value of it. So the absolute value of x minus 2 divided by, now in the denominator, so when I put that function x minus 2, the absolute value of x minus 2, that is, I put parentheses in. The denominator, since there are two terms here, I definitely need to make sure the denominator gets wrapped in parentheses so that the order of operations is handled. Now, if I go over here to table, and I'm just going to delete what I have so far, I will put in my limit values that I'm interested in. If you'll notice, all these values that I put in, I am getting negative 1 back out. So this is negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, negative 1. And that's okay. So what's happening is you're basically looking at the same number because assume, let's say we have a function f of x, which is the absolute value of x minus 2 divided by x minus 2. And suppose we evaluate this at, uh, I don't know, how about 1? Seems easy enough. OK. So I would do the absolute value of 1 minus 2 divided by 1 minus 2. So 1 minus 2 is negative 1. And you would get negative 1 in the numerator and the denominator. Whenever you have the same number divided by itself, you get 1. The only difference is, in the numerator, I'm taking the absolute value, which changes this to a positive 1. So when you take 1 divided by negative 1, the result is negative 1. And anything that I put in that would be less than 2, that would happen. So that's why all of these end up being negative 1. And similarly, if I start putting in values that are greater than 2, you're going to find that they are, in fact, all just 1. So the limit from the left the limit from the left was negative 1, and the limit from the right is positive 1. So these don't agree with one another. There's a big jump at the point uh, 1. Or, I'm sorry, at 2. So this limit does not exist. If we look at the graph, it should make sense. Here's what it looks like. It's effectively a constant value at negative 1, so anything before 2. And then it's a constant value of 1 after the point x equals 2. But there's a big jump in between. And you couldn't put a single number in here to make a continuous curve here. So therefore, the limit does not exist. In this next example, we'll take a look at the, what happens when things go to infinity. So we have uh, a problem in this particular function with an asymptote. So at the limit point, negative 1, there's an asymptote. We have division by 0. So let's see what happens when we try and do this numerically. So we need the limit from the left and we need a limit from the right. Well, we're looking as values approach negative 1. So first off, be careful when you choose your x values. So for instance, let's say here's negative 1, negative 2, and 0. So if I'm doing the limit from the left, I need values that are less than negative 1 but getting close to negative, closer to negative 1. So for instance, um, now, I know the scale wouldn't be right here, but say negative 1.1, then negative 1.01 would get me closer to negative 1. But these would be further away from 0, so that's why it's on the left-hand side. So I would use negative 1.1, negative 1.01, 0, 0, 1, 
and so forth. Okay, uh, we'll do that in a second. Now the limit coming from the right hand side, I need something that is closer to zero than negative one, so negative 0.9, and then something closer to negative one would be negative 0.99, and then like negative 0.999, and so forth. So it's a little trickier when you're dealing with the negative numbers, but just, you know, if you need to draw a number line in order to kind of get yourself started as to what this pattern should look like, then that could be helpful. Once you have that, it's just a matter of plugging things into the calculator to determine what these limits are. So put your function in, and that function, let me scroll back up so you can see it, is 1, and that's just one term in the numerator, so I don't need to put parentheses around it, but you could if you wanted to. In the denominator, there's already parentheses around the x plus 1, and then that's going to get squared. I don't need a second set of parentheses around the square. It, The order of operations says to do exponents before division, so everything will work out fine. Now let's go into the table. Start inputting values, negative 1.1, 1, whoops, negative 1.01, negative 1.001, 1.0001. So I start off with 100 as the first result, and then it jumps up to 10,000. Then I get 1e6, which, again, in the calculator, that's just the way it represents scientific notation. So it means 1 times 10 to the 6th power, so 1 with 6 zeros, so a million. And then 1 to the 8th, so 1 with 8 zeros, which would be 100 million. So it's getting large. It's getting really large. these values are approaching positive infinity. Now, technically that limit does not exist because they're running off to infinity, but we can be a bit more explanative in saying how they're going to infinity could be positive infinity or negative infinity. Now the limit from the right hand side, if I put in negative 0.9, negative 0.99, and so forth. The same sort of pattern is developing here. So I've got 100, 10,000 again, a million. These things clearly aren't approaching a single value. They're just running off to positive infinity again. Now, if this was running to positive infinity on the left, negative infinity on the right, we definitely would write DNE, does not exist. It's still understood that these don't exist, but it's a little bit more explanative to say that the limit is positive infinity. So that's fine, we can do that since they agree. Now, if we take a look at the graph, it should make sense here. So we have negative 1 as an asymptote, the thing where the graph is running to infinity. So as we approach negative 1, that asymptote from the left, the y values are going off to positive infinity. As we approach negative 1 from the right, these y values are also approaching positive infinity. So they just happen to agree, so we can say positive infinity for the final limit. now a piecewise defined function and I've got three different pieces here and I'm going to calculate two limits. So first is the limit as x approaches 1 and the limit as x approaches 4. If you'll notice the boundaries of where these functions are kind of glued together are 1 and 4. So there's no... so the reason why we're choosing those points is Individually, these functions are continuous functions. The only place where we could have a discontinuity is at a boundary point for these piecewise defined functions. Now, what we can do is, because we know that they're continuous um, at these values, 
you can actually calculate this uh, piecewise limit by doing, let's say, the limit as x approaches uh, 1 from the left of your function, the limit as x approaches 1 from the right of your function, by just plugging 1 into each of the different respective functions. So from the left, those would be values that are less than 1. So we would be using the function x squared plus 3. So this would be 1 squared plus 3, which is 4. From the right, so places where x is greater than or equal to 1, we use this function, 5 minus x. So 5 minus 1 is 4. So what I'm working with here is the fact that when you have a continuous function, the limit values and the function values always agree with one another. So individually, these things are continuous. So I'm just seeing if they happen to match up on each side uh, in order to see if the limit at a particular point exists. Here they agree, they're both 4. And you can see this in the graph of the function as well. So as we approach 1 from the left-hand side, that function, which was uh, x squared plus 3, approaches 4. And the limit on the right-hand side, which is uh, 5 minus x, also happens to approach 4. But when we do the limit as x approaches 4, then what we would need is the limit as x approaches 4 from the left-hand side and the limit as x approaches 4 from the right-hand side. So I could plug these, plug 4 into each side of the boundary point. Or I could, since I have the graph here, I could use the graph to observe. These y values here, as I approach 4 from the left, are approaching, it looks like 1. And then as I approach 4 from the right-hand side, these are constants, so this is approaching looks like 3. And if you'll notice, if I had taken 4 and put it into the function uh, 5 minus x, 5 minus 4 is 1, and then the constant function 3, that would agree. But the limit from the left, the limit from the right do not agree with one another. This particular limit does not exist.